Thank you very much, um, Willem and IIAS, for having me here today um, to speak about uh, primarily my book, which is this one, as you can see uh, on my on the screen. Um, the book is called Reading the Muslim on Celluloid, Bollywood Representation and Politics. And um, I will be talk, taking you through some key highlights of what um, the book is about and a little bit beyond what the book talks of um, in my presentation called The Muslim in Bollywood Film Narratives, Evolving Representations. Um, so this is basically how the talk will be structured. I look at very, very briefly some historical uh, facts about the Indian film industry, the Hindi film industry particularly, um, and a bit of theory called the game dimension, which is important in terms of looking at popular cinema that we are concerned with today, um, and go over very, very briefly the imagination and the representation of the Muslim in the history of popular cinema in India, particularly Hindi cinema. And then I come to the major findings of my book, which is to categorize the Muslim uh, as communal, terrorist, and secular between 1991 and 2012. And one key highlight of my presentation today is to go beyond that period and look at some films that have come up after I finished uh, writing my book. And then I finish with some key conclusions, and I hope um, you will bear with me. So if you um, to look at the historical continuities primarily, um, as some of you or most of you would know, cinema came to India, particularly Bombay, in 1896 when the Lumiere brothers presented a series of short films. Um, a few years later, by 1902 or so, Jamshed Ji Madan had already constructed the first rudiments of what is now seen as one of the biggest film empires in the world. Um, the, the history of representation, primarily the representation of marginalized or minority communities um, in Hindi cinema is therefore a long and complex one. So, uh, you know, to go over some uh, theoretical aspects and uh, throughout my study of, of the Muslim representation in Hindi cinema, which is recorded in the book, I became a bit of a fan of this, of this American uh, popular culture theorist um, called John Cavalty, who basically delineates four themes that essentially drive a popular screen narrative. Um, one is the analysis of cultural themes, the concept of the medium, the idea of myth, which is very important in terms of the kind of cinema we are concerned with here, and the concept of formula. And here he talks about game dimension, which is a formula whereby the story must be resolved any which way. So there are two aspects to what Cavalty is calling the game dimension. One is a patterned experience of excitement, suspense, and release associated with entertainment and recreation. And when I'm going through this, I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking of all the movies that you've seen and have followed exactly this formula. The temporary, the second one is a temporary resolution of frustration through escape and fantasy. So we go with some of these sort of theoretical injunctions, go into further into this aspect. As a result, the engagement of popular cinema with a lot of complex and multifarious or multifactored issues like gender or identity or geopolitics even, um, often appears to be superficial, simplistic and commonsensical. Uh, but yet, due to the wide outreach and interest that popular cinema generates, it is imperative to take uh, this facet of pop culture very, very seriously. For a long time, it wasn't taken seriously, but now it is. So to understand um, that the combination of a simplistic view of complex issues with the commercial and public reception of the popular medium could appear to be a rather dangerous sort of a mix, you know. Therefore, in film after Bollywood film, it is quite common to find a very sharply homogenous account of a representation of various identities, um, especially those belonging to minority or marginalized communities. 
just to go over very briefly the the history of the muslim in the his, uh, in, in popular hindi cinema um uh, and my book talks extensively about this but i will just very very briefly go over this four key stages or themes that are delineated in the book are um a muslim in empire cinema where they are basically um shown as barbarians as um you know debauched individuals degenerate uh, rulers who 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 revel in torture and rape and so on and so forth and here one of the earliest films that i i can uh, you know give you as an example is a film called the drum which was released in 1938 which was made in 1938 essentially a british film however um, you have a very significant muslim character here um as you can see on the on the on the screen then you have the category of muslim in partition cinema more often than not uh, they are depicted as aggressors and separatists people who wanted the separation of the country of of hindustan right um particularly in interesting here is a film called garam hawa which although is more suited more looked at as a as a muslim show social rather than a partition film but it is against the backdrop of partition and you also have a film by bibhuti mitra in 1949 called shabnam which sort of depicts the muslim in a in an a, a, in the role of an aggressor in terms of the partition the important category and the most widely um regarded category of muslim muslim representation in the history of hindi cinema is primarily the islamicate film um some of you might be uh, uh, familiar with ira bhaskar and richard allen's book which uh, basically talks about or theorizes more and more on this concept of islamicate cinema um and here there are two two different kinds of you know two categories of cinema basically um one is the his muslim historical as you can see the picture from mughal azam on the screen where um uh, you know the the muslim historical draws its imaginary or the imagery and mise en scene from the historical imagination of power and grandeur of muslims as a rulers of hindustan and on the other hand you have the muslim social uh, which focuses on the feudal aristocratic muslim household at a moment where it is facing a challenge from modernity from the onset of modernity and the last category that i wanted to uh, briefly touch upon is the muslim in non islamicate cinema so this is a period where um, you know this is a period uh, primarily of the 1970s and 80s where you see a number of films which have muslim characters although quite marginal the two image two images that you see on the screen are from kuli where uh, surprisingly the muslim character was the central protagonist of the film however engaging in a in a, a trade or in a profession which is associated more or less with this community of being a porter or a kuli right so they are on the margins but in a largely non islamicate milieu all right so in the onset with the onset of the 1990s you see a, a new kind of imagination of the muslim uh, that begins to emerge in hindi cinema and that is of the muslim terrorist or the violent other and um, i want to highlight here the, I, the the film roja now roja was first made in tamil and then remade in hindi or dubbed in hindi made a lot of money both in tamil and in hindi and roja elicited a debate among uh, academics all across the country about how it starts to depict the muslim here as an as the violent other as the terrorist with connections or links with the outside world and with the outside world meaning pakistan so he's being supported aided and abetted by pakistan so this is the kind of the first film or the first film narrative that starts to talk about or imagine the muslim in this way all right so just coming to some uh, films that i took uh, took as case studies for my book um 
and categorize them as Muslim as communal, Muslim as a terrorist, and Muslim as secular. So let me talk about a film, interesting film, which came out in 2004 called Dave. Um, now, how does this film imagine the Indian Muslim? Now, it does it in terms of the following categories. One, a nationalist, secular Muslim who opposes violence of any kind, a, a Gandhian Muslim. So the gentleman you see on the screen is this character in the film of, of, of a Gandhian Muslim uh, a gentleman, a scholar, and so on and so forth. Fiercely nationalistic. Then you have a young, radicalized Muslim man. Well, the film doesn't really give a convincing argument about how this radicalization occurs, very superficial, very stereotypical. Then you have, uh, you know, the, this, this category of characters, the Muslim politician. And the Muslim politician is essentially the chief beneficiary of the radicalization of the young Muslim, right? He plays the young Muslim in ways that he wants to his benefit. And then you have the female victim, female Muslim female victim of communal violence, often without a voice and who needs to be avenged by the radicalized Muslim male. Although in this film, uh, the, the female character sort of echoed some, you know, um, reflected some of the upheaval that occurred in, in 2002 in Gujarat. But essentially, the female Muslim um, characters, um, until the time, until the recent last 15, 15 years or so, have been pretty voiceless. So what is this film doing? Um, it's one, it is, the, it, it's reflecting the role of the political class in fomenting communal violence because you have very significant um, majority, majority community political leaders in the film narrative as well who are basically colluding with the Muslim politicians um, for their own electoral ends. So you see that uh, the role of the political class as a whole in fomenting communal trouble between Hindus and Muslims is emphasized. Um, even though the Muslim categories are oversimplistic and the visuality is constructed in terms of binary, so there is a good Muslim and a bad Muslim, and I will come to that shortly, the film makes a critical assessment of the role of majority community leaders as well. But you know, this is expected primarily because of, of the filmmaker who was Govind Nihalani, who, who has made in the past very, very sensitive movies as well. Um, while on the topic of the radicalized Muslim, I want to talk very briefly about a film uh, again in 2004, um, which depicts what is known as the quintessential radicalized Muslim, a film called Black Friday. Again, uh, a film that cannot be seen as a commercial success or a commercial film in that sense, but the film did make, um, it did make waves. Um, it's a police procedural. It deals with the aftermath of the Bombay blasts, which occurred in 1993 in, after the riots that occurred between 92 and 93. Um, it's based on a best-selling nonfiction crime book. And it basically depicts um, this, the idea of a quintessentially radicalized Muslim through the processual radicalization of this character that you see on the on the screen here of Badshah Khan, uh, who in, the, in real life actually turned state witness later in the Bombay Blasts case. But the film is majorly sort of depicting the, the radicalization, the process of radicalization of this character called Badshah Khan. Um, and of course, it talks about the aftermath of the bomb blast event all kinds of custodial scenes of custodial torture are replete uh, throughout the film. And of course, there is this final resolution where, of course, you know, one of the bad Muslim characters must, in, in, in very simplistic ways, become a state witness and therefore resolve the whole sort of narrative that was, uh, uh, was started. The next major category that I uh, looked at, I look at in my book, is um, that of the Muslim terrorist in Hindi cinema. And here, um, one of the key points that I'm making is that there is a significant break or a significant distinction in the films produced before and after the 
events of September 11, 2001, or 9 11 as we know it. The one film that, um, that I want to talk about briefly that came before the 9 11 event is this film called Sarfarosh, which was released in 1998. Now, why Sarfarosh? Very significant film because here there is an utter binary distinction between the good Indian Muslim and the bad Pakistani Muslim. Although you do not know until the end of the film that the Pakistani Muslim is actually the terrorist, but the, the distinction sort of starts emerging as you go through the narrative. Um, that is uh, one significant film. And the other one which I want to talk about is a film called Fiza, which was released in 2000. Again, talks about a homegrown Muslim terrorist who is a riot survivor, who was, you know, faced humiliation and death in the family and so on and so forth during the, the riots in Bombay, the communal riots in Bombay, and therefore takes recourse to violence as a terrorist. So here you have in the pre 9-11 period, um, a homegrown Muslim terrorist with very sort of um, localized reasons for undertaking violence. On the other side of 9-11, or the, the post 9-11 period, the, the scenario very interestingly changes and significant narrative changes also take place. Now, one of the significant changes is the location of the Muslim terrorist. Now, in the nine, post 9-11 period, he or she is a global citizen, a global person, apparent, you know, could be living in Europe, could be living in America. You do not know where they come from. Um, the narrative also tends to dwell on these characters who have been dislocated, dislocated because of the violence inflicted on them by Western powers. So this particular film that you see is called Kurban. And there are, there are significant dialogues in the film which talk about how this community or the question was dislocated by the violence depicted, um, uh, uh, inflicted on them by the Western powers. So the tropes uh, that are used in the film, um, you know, significantly base themselves on the international terror networks. These tropes are constantly invoked throughout the, across the world and so on and so forth. So there is no, no uh, imagination anymore of the homegrown boy becoming a terrorist. Now the terrorist is located in a global setting is a very clever, a very suave, a sophisticated man or a group of men who are um, indulging, who are, you know, who are following a number of surveillance and planning methods that are very, very modern and very uh, stealthy, uh, if I may use that term. So the time tested formulaic good Muslim, bad Muslim method is also evoked in this film. Um, and it remains one of the fulcrums of the narrative. Um, which is therefore employed to reach a resolution under our theorization of, of game dimension. Um, of course, there is the simplistic and superficial narrativization of the good Muslim and therefore also the bad Muslim. Um, and two kinds of stereotyping are uh, can be seen in this kind of a narrativization. A, the negative stereotyping of the Muslim characterized as the bad terrorist, as a bad Muslim, and the, the positive stereotyping of the Muslim characterized as the good nationalist Muslim. In a number of these narratives, you also see, um, you know, in case there are uh, in, in, in a foreign or a global setting, um, you, I, can, I can basically say that, you know, a good humanist rather than a good nationalist, right? Um, but there is a very distinct binary uh, you know, separation between the bad Muslim and the good Muslim, the bad terrorist and the good nationalist. Um, and it, it is, of course, super simplistic and, of course, geared towards reaching that final resolution. The third category that I talk about in the book is that of the secular Muslims of Hindi cinema. And um, if for the purposes of, of just going over this, this idea, 
Um, I'll talk about just two films very, very briefly. One is called Rangde Basanti and the other is called Chakde India. You can read all about it in the book. Um, Rangde Basanti again has interestingly a good Muslim protagonist, Aslam, who is at constant war with his family, which, uh, which is really upset with his hobnobbing with non-Muslim friends. Um, the narrative also strives to embellish Aslam's secular credentials. Um, so it's, it's trying very hard to project this character as a secular, as a, as a secular Muslim character. The skirmish that he has with the Hindu nationalist character or the Hindu fundamentalist character also turns into a friendship somewhere along the way. Therefore, signaling the achievement of some kind of an ultimate national ideal of that, you know, where the secular Muslim and the secular or the nationalist turned secular Hindu are friends. So, you know, reaching some sort of a Nehruvian conclusion. The second film is Chuck De India, which is, you know, it epitomized sporting nationalism um, in, in Hindi cinema. One of the films that epitomized sporting nationalism. And as you are aware, um, Indians are largely driven by two kinds of two words that begin with a C, cinema and cricket. So sporting nationalism plays a huge role. In this film, which is not based on cricket, but on hockey, um, it juxtaposes the loyalty factor of the Muslim against a largely on, you know, through a largely gender focused narrative. Um, and this engagement with sporting nationalism and the loyalty question makes the resolution quite subliminal. Although they want to reach a very simplistic uh, resolution and they do at the at the end reach a simplistic resolution ultimately. But they, tr you know, it's it's rather an interesting, a subliminal kind of engagement between um, sporting nationalism and this question of Muslim loyalty to the Indian nation. In 2012 is, you know, 2011 and 12 are the two years where one sees uh, one, one basically witnesses some sort of mainstreaming of the Muslim character. So bringing the Muslim from the margins to the center of the film or center of the narrative or mainstreaming the Muslim. A film called Gangs of Vasepur, which was in two parts, a very long film. Um, um, you know, it places the Muslim at the center of the narrative without alluding to religious symbolism. So it's, it's, it has been described also as a Muslim Mahabharat in many ways, because it has the largest number of an ensemble cast of Muslim characters, not Muslim actors, but Muslim characters um, in, in the film. And um, the only religious symbol that you see of, of, of Muslimness in the film is through a Muharram procession. But that is, of course, quite key to the narrative. Um, and I see Gangs of Vasipur in my book as one of the films that sort of epitomizes the secularization of the subaltern Muslim. Um, of course, it focuses on crime and criminals. Partha Chatterjee has argued against the film, saying that, you know, it is doing just exactly what earlier films did, depict Muslims as criminals. But my point here is that it, the focus of Gangs of Vasipur is on crime and criminals, but not just Muslim criminals. The point is not that the criminals are Muslim. The point about point of this film is that they are criminals. So that's 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 what's different about about this film. And that's what's interesting also about this film. All right. Um, I don't I don't know how much time I have left, uh, but Yes, maybe a little bit, but I'll quickly go through some uh, important examples of what is happening after 2012. That's where my, my book ends in 2012. Um, a film called Baby in 2015. So this trend, you, you see the trend towards this globalization or internationalization of the Bollywood terrorist has continued. Uh, there is a lot of focus on sophisticated intelligence, mass surveillance, covert operations, um, you see shades of Hollywood response to 9-11 in, 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 the, in the outpouring of films and TV shows that occurred after 9-11 in Hollywood. So you have, you know, series like 24 Homeland. 
you know films like baby or holiday are very much on the in, in the same genre as as let's say 24 or homeland um the narrative also builds a binary visualization of the muslim terrorist so there are the good guys and the bad guys the good muslims and the bad muslims so that binary representation is continuing as it were in 2017, there was this interesting film called Tiger Zinda Hai, pretty recent, um, which, according to me, is perhaps the only popular formulaic engagement with the idea or the phenomenon of the Islamic State or the, or the you know, the, the violence of the Islamic State. Um, now, here, another interesting thing is happening. It's juxtaposing the Indian hero with a Pakistani heroine against an outsider terrorist. Um, an Arab, a, a person of Arab origin, let's say, thereby imagining some sort of a, a South Asian, um, a South Asian utopia, let's say. So the narrative undertakes to follow the game dimension and ultimately arrives at an easy and stereotypical resolution. Of course, the destruction of of this of this outsider villain and so on and so forth. Um, but it's doing some interesting experimentation. Um, as I can see, um, an interesting film that that is, I mean, interesting for me, although, you know, um, it, it, it was, you know, uh, panned by a lot of critics uh, is, is a film called My Name is Khan, which attempted to engage with the issues of homeland security and in America in the aftermath of 9-11. So, yeah, the theme of 9-11 is still continuing, as we can see. In the aftermath of of but uh, this was in 2010 so before um be before the uh, you know the idea of my before my book ends basically um another recent film which is interesting in our uh, in our um, explication today is a film called razi which is a bolder representation of the secular muslim in this case a female spy who actually marries into a family of pakistani soldiers um to get classified information as in India, right? So this is this film is interrogating the question of Muslim men. Go back to Chuck Day India. It's the same same idea that's playing out here as well, that of Muslim loyalty. Um, but it conflates gender with contemporary geopolitics uh, through this through this idea of a strong female Muslim protagonist, which makes this film quite interesting. Um, in my view. Another interesting film is that is Pari. Uh, Pari is interesting because it's it's a horror film. It's from the horror genre and it's exploring the Muslim question through the horror genre. Um, and it is also attempting to look at, uh, attempting to make a horror noir appraisal of the 1971 Bangladesh war or the aftermath of the 1971 Bangladesh war. And this makes it uh, it's engaging with Muslim occult practices in Bengal as well. So it is, and you know, again, experimenting with keeping the Muslim in the mainstream and the center of the film, but um, you know, experimenting with various themes around it. Um, then you have a typical Bollywood romance film called Air Dil Hai Mushkil, where um, you see the traces of mainstreaming of the Muslim, which is basically trying to remove any obvious associations with minority politics, communalism, or even violence, which was the mainstay of Muslim representation for many years in the Hindi film industry. Bajrangi Bhaijan is another interesting film, which is again talking about this South Asian utopia of uh, immense love and camaraderie between Indian Hindus and Pakistani Muslims, which of course all of us uh, want to achieve. Um, but then, you know, it engages with the question of, uh, it's also engaging with the question of CBMs between the two countries, um, between the two neighbors who have been at war forever and ever. Um, you also see the return of the Muslims through these two films that you see on the screen called Deir Ishq and Dawate Ishq. Again, you see the vestiges of Muslim feudality in these film, in these films, poetry, courtesans, cuisine, 
Um, although it explores some largely universal themes such as gender and patriarchy, and even the, the scourge of dowry in the, in, in, in the case of Dawat de Ishq. I haven't talked of Kashmir at all, but I will talk a bit about Heather. Heather uh, reassesses the Kashmir conflict uh, through a Shakespearean recasting, uh, of, as many of you might know who have watched Heather or have read about it. Um, it sort of attempts to explore the necropolitics or the necronationalism that surrounds the on screen, or has surrounded the on screen popular imagination of the Kashmir conflict. However, I find that the Muslims, Muslimness of the characters takes a backseat um, as the questions of are explored in Heather. So I'll quickly sum up. I know I'm over time and I'm sorry. Um, so the question of representation of the Muslim really can't be adequately addressed until you draw lineages from the establishment of the Hindi film industry in Bombay to the introduction of light and sound and the fragmentation of the craft of filmmaking into genres and types. So Muslim social, for instance, is a, is a major genre of cinema. Um, so in the 1970s and 80s, as we discussed, saw the portrayal of the subaltern Muslim, but on the margins primarily in films like Kuli, Mukaddar Ka Sikandar, Zanjeer, and so on and so forth. Um, the othering of the Muslim emerges on screen in the 1990s, primarily with films like Roja and Bombay. So the period between 1991 and 2012 is significant and the period of discussion in my book, because it is one of the one of great communal upheaval in the body politic of India. And it changed the public perception and imagination uh, of the Muslim in general, which was then reflected in the simplified and binary portrayals that one sees of this period. Um, you also have the predominance of positive stereotyping of the Muslim. Um, and the binary representations of good and bad and moving towards a simplified resolution of very complex plot lines concerning gender identity and geopolitics. Um, the dominant discourse of Muslim disloyalty to the Indian nation has remained a constant through these narratives. Somewhere along the way, you have this, uh, this, this, this trope. The exceptions are therefore celebrated in full cinematic glory. An example is the film Razi. Between 2010 and 12, a kind of driving out of magic or driving out of religion from cinema occurred, um, particularly in terms of the Muslim. Um, <clears throat> and the on-screen Muslim are brought into the mainstream, um, posited as central protagonists and not as challengers to the status discourse. Now, this disenfranchisement of the cinematic Muslim brings us to the problematic of representation, which is what I conclude my book with and um, that's essentially what I um, finish with. So even as secularization seems to have occurred, the adherence to the dominant discourse has solidified, particularly with regard to perceptions of aggression and violent sexual behavior on the part of the Muslim. So that is, of course, the problematic of representation that I'm talking about. The secularized Muslim, therefore, seems to prosper but within the framework of the dominant majoritarian discourse. Um, I will skip this one. And one also tends here to observe the a greater proclivity of filmmakers to indulge in wider thematic experimentations with the Muslim posited as a central protagonist, for instance, in Paris. So you have these new experimentations happening after 2012. And I will finish with this. It is imperative, therefore, to view the phenomenon of the mainstreaming, therefore also secularization of the Muslim in popular Hindi cinema in all its complexity. The problematic of representation, um, as I outlined in my book, provides some pointers towards such a complex understanding of identity formation on the silver screen, of course, pending further investigation and research. Thank you for your attention.